Hello, everyone who has uh, just joined us. Uh, this is Nisreen Hussain. Um, I'm lecturer in contemporary theatre at Middlesex University based in London, and I'll be the chair of the event today. And I'm very pleased to introduce the first event in the Artist Ideas Now, which is a series of artist-led conversations looking at some of the major issues facing us and the world today. The series respond to the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival's both themes of climate crisis and its impact in the Middle East and North Africa. And the series is curated by um, uh, or in collaboration with Creative Destruction Initiative. So today's event specifically reflects on democracy, democracy and citizenship in the face of the climate crisis, asking what can we do as citizen in order to affect um, a meaningful and large scale um, change um, in the broader uh, systematic um, um, structure um, um, of, of the world and the various, the, the various levels that um, uh, govern and the shape that the crisis and the challenges surrounding the climate crisis. And it also asks how can we activate ourselves and our communities in engaging with these uh, processes and these conversations. And with us today, we have three wonderful speakers to lead the conversations, and they are artists and activists who are actively engaged in these questions and the wider ideas, and who are working on um, projects that um, heighten the awareness of the climate crisis and that activate uh, wider communities around the challenges surrounded the current crisis. Um, and I have the honor to introduce uh, this, our speakers today. Uh, starting with Majid Majid. Um, Majid is a British Somali climate justice activist and writer, and he's the youngest and first Green Party councillor to hold the role of Lord Mayor of Sheffield. He's the founder of Union of Justice organization that is dedicated to racial justice and climate justice. Then we have Sama Al Shaibi. Um, Sama is a Palestinian Iraqi conceptual artist whose photographs and videos deal with spaces of conflict and explore subjects of war, exile, power, and survival. And last but not least, Akram Salhab, who's a filmmaker, activist, and organizer working for London based charity Migrant Organize. He is a campaigner for refugee rights and Palestinian rights. And Akram recently presented a very powerful short documentary for Channel 4 in the UK that deals with the silencing of Palestinian voices in the UK. Um, and now I'd like to um, hand over the space to the speakers to introduce themselves and, and to um, speak a little bit about their work, um, starting with Majid. So if you can unmute yourself. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction, Esrin. And it's a real joy and privilege to be sharing this space with so many amazing, wonderful people doing incredible things. And just to kind of elaborate and a bit of what you kind of touched upon in terms of the work that I do. And I mean, to mainly kind of look at the intersection between climate and race, because like the reality is that there is a clear and crucial connection between climate and race, because we can't talk about the climate crisis without also recognizing that it is an inequality and race issue because the effects of the climate crisis everywhere are massively unequal and unfair. It was frustratingly something that was created by um, the privileged few people, mainly those living in the global north, but it is hitting ethnic minorities and marginalized communities the hardest here in the global north, but of course, mainly in the global south. And Honestly, without some sort of radical and rapid change, of course, like this unjust trend just kind of adds itself to all the other, you know, profound historic injustices, black and brown and, and many other people across the country and across the continent, across the world already face. And just to kind of give some examples of this and from a, just even from a very close to home, UK an example is, and the tragic death of Ella Kissy Debro, who at the age of nine years old from South London, died from air pollution. And this is just one example of many of how poor communities, which frequently are also ethnic minority communities and often concentrated around main roads and major cities, suffer the consequences of decisions made by people who often have absolutely, you know, no idea of their plights. And they've got the dirtiest industries in their backyards 
And many of their children and young people, as a result, get asthma as well. And even if we really look at, like, for example, green spaces, like, as we know, like, green spaces should be accessible to as many people as possible. And it's been proven for a long time that you are more likely to visit green spaces if you do not have to travel ridiculous amounts of distances to reach it. And I'm sure, like, like you all know the benefits of having green spaces. Of course, sadly, it's something that's not accessible to uh, many marginalized communities. And it's been long said that someone's postcode is a better predictor of their health than anything else. And if we really deep it and kind of look into it, where people live has been shaped by a long history of racial discrimination, both explicit and implicit. Our national government in the UK, as well as local governments, have really often, shall we say, invested heavily in improving A neighborhoods by and planting trees, building parks, beautifying the areas by at the same time completely neglecting other areas. And class also does play a big role in it, as there is the, as the nature gap is directly correlated and um, to the wealth gap. And that's just and one example, and it's very kind of it's mirrored a lot across Europe as well. And the work that I do and um, with Union of Justice and um, is an organization I set up with so many other incredible people. So what Union of Justice is is that we're a European independent and people of color led organization that is dedicated to race and climate justice and of course we maintain that there's a clear and crucial connection between uh, between both of them we're a team made up of community activists researchers artists and elected representatives from across europe all working towards building a europe and world that is equitable just and sustainable so what we do is we're like we We've got like three pillars. The first thing that we um, focus on is empowering others. So at the moment, we're kind of building a vibrant people of color network across Europe, or equipped with the skills and the knowledge to bring about change in their communities. Second pillar is influence. As we kind of proudly say, we are not a neutral organization. I don't think we can afford to be neutral. So we'll openly and proudly advocate for positions and policies that in any way promote racial equality and climate justice. And the third pillar is change. Because like campaigning is, well campaigning for radical change is at the heart of what we do. Of course, it's the, as we say, it's a source of engagement with the public and the jail that really, that's kind of connecting each of our operations from local campaigns within specific regions and national campaigns aiming to shift policy within the European Union, mainly currently looking at the European Green Deal, but not only that, also looking at um, climate reparations is, is the big campaign that we're actually doing leading up to COP26. And I'll basically stop there before and I kind of waffle on too much. And I'm looking forward to kind of delving into all the topics of democracy and what it is that we can all do to kind of play our role. Thank you very much, Majid. And, and thank you also for bringing up this, uh, quite rightly, this um, interconnected between the issues of operational justice, uh, social justice, and environmental justice. And this is something that I would hope that we can unpack further later on. Um, Sama, if you can please introduce yourself a little bit further. I've, I've given a, a very brief introduction initially, so I hope that you can expand more on, on yourself and on your work. Thank you so much, Nisreen. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with everybody today, and what a powerful start to our conversation. I'm going to be sharing my screen to show a bit of my work um, and uh, some of the major themes that I uh, talk about through my, my, my conceptual art, my photography, and my videos and installations. And um, hopefully you can see all that. And uh, OK, so I'm a Palestinian Iraqi whose family was exiled from two homelands. I spent my formative years migrating across several Middle Eastern countries as a political refugee. My photographs and videos and installations link the physical and psychological dispossession of the body in relationship to land, resources, and identity. Um, magical realism and fictional portraiture are prevailing genres that guides my artistic production. I use their transformative and temporal qualities to construct hypothetical narratives concerned with the actual current social, political, and, um, and environmental upheavals, and specifically those relating to the already displaced, while also drawing attention to the impending uprooting of people. 
The project Between Two Rivers, this is a, an older project of mine, implicates Western imaginings of Middle East and North African women's actual struggles, which are obscured behind the singular preoccupation with the hijab. The obsession around the politics of bailing um, in relation to Muslims, women's bodies, and so-called freedom continues in contemporary Western media imagery today. Photographs are weaponized to justify wars and occupation. Visualizing Middle Eastern women's empowerment should be measured in terms of social, political, and economic rights, such as access to jobs, education, and healthcare, um, and the critical importance of women's physical security in order to, uh, to safely access those rights. So my work resists this conflation of Middle Eastern women's equality and empowerment with the exportation of Western democracy justified through instrument, instruments of US-led wars. My most recent installation, the secession, um, aims to call attention to the invisibility of Iraqi women who have disappeared or been assassinated during the US-led war in Iraq and its aftermath. The lack of official investigations has resulted in the ongoing targeted assassinations of other prominent women today in Iraq today. So words and frag fragmented phrases carved into the vessels are drawn from the compiled assassination lists of Iraqi academics, uh, particularly focused on the women that were assassinated. Um, I also, also another sort of aspect of my work, I often look to the natural world for contexts that can articulate communal structures that are under threat. In several of my projects, I visualized the real world epidemic of the colony collapse uh, disorder of, amongst the honeybees as a symbolic dilemma of our delicate coexistence with the ecosystems and one another and relationships that are gravely threatened under our, um, our common uh, struggle for survival. So in this project, Exodus, a large scale wooden vertebra skeleton of a human form is attached to a collapsed metal bee wings. The central sculpture is surrounded by fleshy resin casts of hollyhock plants, um, and they emit sound, which are Iraqi lullabies. And it's against a backdrop of a projection running of a river that slowly is tainted by an irrational spilling of red. In 2009, I began a project in search of a counter narrative that would forward a shared common identity amongst our region's inhabitants, one that wasn't defined by war necessarily or rooted in national nationalism. Silsila, which is the Arabic word for link, is a multimedia project produced over eight years in remote natural locations in the Middle East and North Africa. My original aim was to highlight the land and resources like desert and water in a shared continu continuum of time, place, and culture. Um, this was the first project I made that where climate change intersects my concern with migration. Um, so I started that back in 2007, really, or 2008. My work evolved because of my continual exposure to the effect of water stress on natural spaces and its contribution towards straining the economic, social, and political conditions of the, of the, of the places I lived amongst to make the work. My method of production was based on the journeys of the 14th century explorer Ibn Battuta, who traveled 75,000 miles after initially setting out to perform Islam's compulsory hajj, um, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca in his home in Morocco. So I applied his book, Al Rahla, The Travels, as a practical guide in loca locating territory of historical importance. But then I was also enacting my own journey as a metaphor of migration across territorial boundaries that erases nationhood. Um, and so, yeah, it's estimated that there is less than 800 square miles of fresh water left in the semi-arid lands worldwide, the worst stress all being in the Middle East and North Africa, 80 to 100 million people in the Middle East and North Africa region will be water stressed or water displaced by the year 2025. And so like oil, water is an essential to all human activities, but of which no sustainable alternative exists. And water scarcity is not new to the region, but the ability to actually respond effectively is pro protracted not only by climate change, but also because of this disintegrating management amongst a rapidly growing political unrest. So everything from droughts to rising sea levels, water contamination, desertification, and water territorial disputes is exasperated by, um, uh, by these wars and conflict where there's no cooperation to make things work. Um, so forecasts of the colossal eco-refugee populations and mass migrations are an imminent reality. And I think I'm running out of time, so I will just let this last few images show. 
Um, and basically, I'm just suggesting in Silsila that survival is only possible through mindfulness, human interdependency, and ecological coexistence. And that's the very heart of my project, my work, linking bodies, histories, and struggles, and recognizing our position within it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sama. And it's such a privilege to have an opportunity also to see images of your work and, and the powerful image where your body is placed as a site of performance, which in itself is a form of creative disruption in terms of, of challenging Orientalist views of, of, of the Arab woman or the, the, the body of, an, of, of the Arab woman that, and, and a view that is um, often channeled through the colonial gaze. So thank you again for sharing your work. Um, uh, so Akram, if you can turn on your camera, please, and if you can share a little bit more about yourself and your work. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nasreen, and thanks for Liverpool Arts Festival for organizing this really wonderful panel. Um, I'm, my name is Akram, I'm Scouse Palestinian, so very happy to be <clears throat> on this panel, feel right at home. Um, in the city of Liverpool talking about Palestine. So what I want to really talk about is kind of, I'll try and talk about my own experience and um, how I ended up doing the work that I was doing and what I think that says about specifically the state of democracy in Britain at the moment. And I really congratulate the organizers of the event because I think the question was perfectly pitched. Um, you know, this is about democracy uh, and as I grew up in Palestine and partly in the UK, I came to see that many of the things that we took for granted, a desire for freedom, a desire for rights, a desire to live in a way with dignity and with justice, was something that was completely misconstrued in the Western media in terms of terrorism and hatred of the other and religious fanaticism and what have you. And growing up with that complete contradictory explanation of the same situation was what really, uh, and I think for a lot of young people, young, young Muslims, you can say in the UK, was something that was a real spark for a lot of anger and frustration. Um, but then when I, and I came to the UK in 20, the last time I moved was 2013. The other thing I found was that there was a very, there's a big contradiction. Well, there was, there was a system of colonialism which we as Palestinians study from when we're very young, you know, we know Britain's role in, in Palestine and what they did in terms of handing over our country. Um, but most people in Britain don't know about this colonial legacy and they don't know about its active manifestations today. And when I began obviously doing the work I'm, I do on Palestine, you know, um, arguing for Palestinian rights, advocating for it, organizing among students, raising awareness, I found that there was a lot of overlap with the other area of work that I began to undertake around migrant justice. And the common theme and the common thread throughout what I could see was happening was that the way the British policy was arranged, whether from the hostile environment, which aims to prevent migrants from integrating into British society, or the prevent legislation which uh, targets and criminalizes particularly Muslim communities, but also others who are politically engaged <clears throat> in opposition to injustice and colonialism, was that the British political structure was constructed in order to alienate and prevent minority communities from articulating what we can call a broadly anti-colonial politics. Uh, and you know, there was one of the one of the events that I organized as a student was about um, the uprooting of uh, olive trees in Palestine. Millions of trees have now been uprooted in Palestine, citrus trees, olive trees, and others. And we were saying that the indigenous struggle of the Palestinian people is intimately tied to that, to um, questions of the environment. Um, and we were told that this was an unacceptable event to be running. We, we were shouted at and <clears throat> harassed by others in, this, in the student union. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's an, a, the only way you can continue with this very abnormal situation in which the destruction of our environment and colonial occupation of other countries, the repression and suppression of um, communities here is if you create a, you, if you create silence around the issues that matter to us and that anti-colonial agenda is latent in a lot of the politics that we see around us as young people growing up in minority communities in the UK or growing up here in Palestine but their their 
the political sphere is constructed so that there isn't democracy for this portion of the population. I think that's part of what is not understood. It's not that every single, it's not that necessarily in the constitution you have a separate set of rights, but the hostile environment and the prevent um, and the, what's happened around Palestine in the past few years all serve in a, all work in a pre-criminal space. They prevent you living a normal life. They place barriers, if not strict laws, they place barriers to you entering the public sphere, articulating um, what you believe and participating in society more fully. And I think the, what we're coming to understand, and that is why, you know, measured and other people's work is so important, is that the, the, the struggle for uh, racial justice, the struggle against colonialism, is intimately tied to the struggle for climate justice. And I think um, when, we, when we think of the movements we want to create, and we think of the moments that we see unfolding as we try and bring about um, an end to this you know, rapid destruction of our <clears throat> habitat on Earth, I think that one of the key st staging points in that will be the dismantling of the silencing, the structures of suppression, the structures by which entire communities are removed from the political map. Um, so I think that in that understanding, we can really begin to articulate a different kind of environmental politics, one which is intimately tied with the kind of struggles that we are undertaking in an everyday sense. And so I think that um, you know, a lot of the work that I see politically going forward is that we have to find moments where we can open up that space, liberate different spheres for people to organize and work in. And that's a big part of the movements we, we need to go going forward. Um, and I'll stop there. I think that's my five minutes. But thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Akram. And thank you for raising these um, crucial and important points so persuasively. And it's, it's very important how you started your um, a brief presentation by problematizing the notion of, of Western democracy or, or how that notion is, is, is currently applied or understood or practiced in the UK. And this is something that um, I hope also that, that we unpack further later on. Um, and it's also exciting to see that the different resonances and the connections between the di different uh, practices coming from a different perspective and different backgrounds. And I'd like to go back to um, um, Majid's discussion around um, Union of Justice, um, the independent um, European organization that is led by uh, people of color and that's dedicated to issues of, of social justice and, um, and, and environmental justice and, 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 in, and the interconnection, um, uh, as you all said, in various ways uh, between those issues. Um, because uh, people of color um, haven't only been disadvantaged in terms of environmental policies and in terms of access to, to green spaces and natural spaces, but there is also a disadvantage in, in the level of, on the level of representation. When we look at um, a broader activist movement and, environment, and, and environmental movements, um, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, they tend to be predominantly white. Um, and I wonder if this is something um, that is in, intently tackled by the organization? And, and if so, how, how did you address these disparities, the imbalances in representation um, in the broader environmental movements? Brilliant, thank you very much. Yeah, you're 100% right. Like it's from the main actors to the, the whole climate movement to climate organizations has inherently and being led by white people. And of course, there's been some amazing work done by, of course, by Greta Thunberg, like Sir David Attenborough, and they've all played really important kind of key roles in that. But just by solely kind of always pushing their voices, it kind of completely ignores and kind of like tells one story of the climate crisis, even though we know it disproportionately affects uh, black and brown people, mainly in the global south and kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's been a long ongoing mission. I think lots of organizations and people are kind of really starting to kind of, first of all, really understand the intersection between climate and race, but as well kind of trying to do something about it, whatever that be. And I think this is where storytelling really, really kind of comes in because it kind of like, it sets a kind of powerful narrative uh, because stories kind of just not only kind of shape the narrative, but kind of really create that kind of sense of urgency for people to kind of be like, oh, wait a minute, like climate isn't just a middle-class issue, which we, always kind of feel like it is because the people involved are either academics or white people even like when we look at the whole climate strike youth youth climate strikers 
And in Sheffield and other places, predominantly white young people, white students were predominantly involved um, with the climate. That's not to say black and brown ethnic people don't care about the climate. And it's, it, it could be further from the truth. It's even my, my mom, her relationship to the climate is talking about in Somalia, how her family and the droughts and, and basically affected the camel grazing and, and all aspects of it. So it's, 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 it's a kind of real, um, kind of real big issue. But also you can kind of link kind of like um, colonialism in that because of course, like throughout the 19th and like 20th century, like nation states are mainly, like mainly countries in Europe and who are of course like the world's biggest emitters of carbon pollution. And as a result, kind of have really become some of the world's kind of biggest, wealthiest um, countries as a result of that. And I guess the relations got to the kind of global south is that it largely sadly happened at the expense of countries in the global south. And as a result of colonial and post-colonial relations that still kind of uh, ongoing today, because we still, when we think of colonialism, we kind of think that, oh, it's something that happened years ago and it's still not kind of going on today. It's still happening today on many, uh, like in kind of lots of different forms kind of thing. That's why myself and many other kind of people believe, I guess like Europe, and uh, can believe that Europe like has got a moral obligation and to kind of compensate those countries and, and, and those communities negatively in, impacted by the climate and crisis due to, should we say like our global north's kind of collective failure to kind of take reasonable steps to kind of limit our emissions past and present. So I think what we must, I think that kind of, especially with my kind of COP26 kind of hat and coming and leading up to COP26, what we kind of like really need to do is compensate countries for past wrongdoings through reparations that kind of unlock funds and resources to the benefit of like those frontline communities affected and by centuries of colonial rule and legacies of extraction and exploitation, it kind of left behind. And I think a real, a real first step and an essential step, which will be amazing towards repairing kind of this historic and injustice is for countries. And I look at Europe and North America as a whole to kind of um, countries, those countries, as you say, those countries that kind of colonized and kind of like to immediately kind of have some sort of wide ranging program of debt cancellation. Because I think that would be a real good start because just to at least break and um, one link in that long history of extractive exploitation, basically. It's, yeah. it's, so that's basically ideally what we would love to kind of do. In, in that sense, I think the organization is really uniquely positioned is that it, it has this huge capacity to, to mobilize wider communities and to engage um, uh, more black members of the community and people of color um, as a way of facilitating and fostering a space that is more inclusive around issues of, of climate, uh, the climate crisis. And I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the examples of how you've approached and engaged with wider communities in ways that activates members of the, of the public and, and motivates um, uh, perhaps younger people or, or, or different generations to engage with these issues more. Yeah, of course. So I guess first and foremost, it's not, I would say it's just a case of first because I would say because a lot of a lot of people say a lot of black and brown people of color basically, let's just use people of color, don't engage with climate and because they've got um they, they traditionally live in shall we say more socially deprived communities who are directly affected by the climate crisis and it's hard for people to and think about what's going to happen in the future rather than what's happening in the present. And like even, for example, in Sheffield, Sheffield, London, Birmingham, and Manchester have been simultaneous campaigns, for example, that look at air pollution. Because like just, I think in, in Manchester alone, air pollution contributes to 700 early deaths. So there was kind of campaign and where I kind of like, which was a people of color led campaign that basically uh, went to run schools to kind of make sure that cars that were idling outside schools were kind of um, turned off, for example. But also even like, honestly, like storytelling has also been a big part of it, where there's been um, a series of kind of like, whether that be literature, video campaigns in regards to sharing stories with people that live in the UK linked to their um, countries where they've kind of orig originated from or their diaspora to link in the kind of relationship between climate back where they and their families from linked to kind of where they are but even honestly there's been 
many cases where mosques have taken a real kind of and 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 lead on what you call it tackling the climate where friday sermons like there's a, there's a specific campaign that's trying to get friday sermons and um, which is the friday prayers which is and the muslims kind of like holy say the week to basically deliver have a sermon dedicated to the climate the crisis and of course there's many things that the quran and it says that we're custodians and on this earth that we need to protect and not. So there's, there's a kind of like religion kind of like, there's a kind of faith-based campaign that's also happening. And I think we really need to tackle it from as many different fronts as uh, possible. But also just from what I see from the UK and across Europe, which I know well, is a lot of the kind of key people who are those who are, I think a lot of people are forced to come to the climate movement, not necessarily because it's something that they were learned about or um, they got asked to do. A lot of the people of color in the climate movement, from my experience, because they're forced it because it's their neighborhoods that are under attack due to what you call it, um, fracking taking place there, water conditions are terrible, air pollution is terrible. And I think we're really starting to see a lot of, which we're starting to see at the moment, like a lot of kind of people of color led organizations, activists that are really uh, to take it, trying to take the handle of things. Excellent. Thank you, Majid. Um, and, and finally, Majid, you, you write a lot and engage with what you describe as the art of disruption. Um, and, and also, I, I should point out your incredible position as not just the youngest, but also the first Muslim uh, British Somali um, uh, former refugee um, mayor of, of Sheffield, which is an, an incredible um, achievement. And I don't even know where to start in terms of unpacking the complexity of that position. But one thing that is really obvious to me is that that position in itself is an act of disruption in UK's political spaces. Um, and I wonder from your point of view, when you talk about the art of disruption um, or creative disruption, um, what does it mean? How can we creatively disrupt? And, and, and why is it important? Yeah, I'd also say just to kind of uh, add to that, um, I was also an elected um, um, representative. In the, I was a member of the European Parliament and as well, and in Brussels, which represent in Yorkshire and the Humber, which of course is a whole different kettle of fish. But I guess, honestly, I think one way we can kind of, first of all, it's, it's, we've kind of, shall we say, like, we've kind of been socially conditioned to believe that elected representatives come from a specific background or look, look a specific and uh, type type of way. So when somebody who's um, black, brown or somebody different kind of comes and takes that space, it kind of becomes a bit of a shock to a lot of people. And it's, so when I kind of really took up those spaces, it was a real struggle, but I kind of really got a lot of conviction being like unapologetic in myself. And I think one real big part of disruption is being authentic to, uh, to who you are, not necessarily trying to fit the mold or kind of really like fit some sort of tradition because there's sort of like traditions everywhere and one of the things i say is like tradition is just peer pressure from dead people so it's sort of upon us to kind of really create our own traditions kind of set our own path so it's it's pretty so it's we've got no alternative if if we really want to have a healthy democracy where our elected representatives reflect the people that they represent we have to kind of put ourselves forward as, as, as candidates, support other people, because also it's, you don't you don't have to have a fancy title like a mayor, councillor or an MEP to bring about some sort of change, but it's important that you do engage, that you're involved in that democratic process in some capacity shape, in, in some capacity or not kind of thing. And of course, it's going to be difficult. It's, it's going to come with its own challenges, like you'll, ha you'll suffer from the imposter syndrome and at times, but it's, I guess I'd like, take comfort and, and solace from the people that believed in me, like whether that be my uh, mother who sacrificed, friends who grounded me, because you slowly realize that you don't do things by yourself. And I've kind of like got this belief that God gave us two hands, one to climb and the other to lift people as we're climbing. So it's also incumbent upon us to kind of make sure that we're giving space to other people as, uh, as, uh, as much as possible. So that's why I've always mentored lots of kind of young people of color and trying to navigate the space of politics and want to kind of get elected and stuff like that. So it's, there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot, there's a lot that we could be doing a lot more as well, but it's, we can't afford to be indifferent basically. Thank you, Majid. This is usually inspiring. Um, uh, also how you actively shifted the narrative and, and took up space in an otherwise 
um, 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 inaccessible spaces um, beyond the current um, uh, established and fixed structure in the, the, the British political scene. So thank you very much for your insights on that. Um, and on that note around uh, creative disruption, Salma, also in your work, you did disrupt, as I said earlier, um, fixed narratives and, and um, ways of framing and representing um, the Arab female body. Um, and um, you've, and by, by using your, yourself and your body as a site of performance um, uh, and um, uh, as a way of, of tackling issues around war and, and displacement. Um, you also navigate issues surrounding your own body as the, the object of, of the artwork. So I wonder what kind of um, questions you are also engaging with, or if you can, if you can unpack the questions surrounding um, the presence of your body as, as the subject of, of the work itself and how it is a subject, but at the same time, it is also the object of the piece. And I wonder if, if um, um, you can share more around how you are tackling these complexities and the paradoxes of the, the, the presence in, of, of your body as at the center of the work. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so I've always, I've been long interested in the image of the female figure um, because it, it's, it's um, the, the representation of the female figure in art. Um, it, it dates back to Palestinian. It's not the only country that has ever used um, the, the site of the female body as nation, but it also um, uh, plays into national, Palestinian national struggles and how the physical representation of the motherland is made through the female body. And this, I think, is um, very attuned to um, uh, an early understanding of how the East, the so-called uh, Middle East and North Africa, understood how the West was depicting um, their inferiority um, through uh, Orientalist, colonialist images. Of, of the woman. So the, the, the early renderings, whether it be painting or drawings, but I'm primarily interested in photography and images, um, these kinds of images that were made and they were sent and peddled back in the, in the West and Europe and the United States, um, objectified and, and sort of painted um, Arab women, uh, Middle Eastern North African women as primitive, as docile, uh, lacking social context, um, and the other, right? And so uh, it, it sort of presented a backwardness. And I'm studying photography and looking how the image history, how it it has new forms um, in contemporary media today, where it's the um, it's it's either the oppression of Arab women or it's the terrorist body. Um, and so there's other ways of of excluding uh, and flattening that complexity of, of uh, our experiences and our histories through um, the instrument of a camera and image. And so I think that's primarily where it, it arose that I would use my own body as a, um, as a symbolic container to this representation um, and that I would be able to perform uh, through costume site, um, scarification on the body um, to these issues in a, in a contemporary uh, way. But, but pointing back to that image history, that historical imagery where photography rose, the technology of photography rose with the, the, the rise of imperialism um, um, on an on a international scale. Um, so did I answer all the questions there? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Um, so going back to that piece between two river where you are depict depicted in, in the project um, and you've mentioned um, briefly earlier, that it it, um, it addresses the, um, uh, the the views of of women as as being liberated through war under the guise of democracy. So I'm I'm interested in in also learning more about what inspired you to create that piece, but also in terms of um, um, how the body itself is is represented and how the um, 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 the, the the surface of the body itself is is disrupted through the scarring, the different forms of scarring and wounding on the surface of, of, of the body of, of the skin. Um, so I'm I'm also fascinated in, in hearing you commenting on that um, and 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 what it represents in the wider scheme of that project. Um, 
Okay, so it's I'm going to have to try to enter that through three or four different directions and keep it uh, succinct. Um, first inspired, obviously, looking at the imagery that was, um, uh, well, I will say first just being really disgusted by the, the way that the conversation when the United States was starting to uh, lose the war <laughs> um, and lose the narrative, right, that um, this unpopular, immoral, illegal war was happening and that Iraqis didn't just basically lay roses down on the feet of the US soldiers and it wasn't just a, you know, a successful mission that was wrapped up in a few minutes. Um, and so this um, Bush administration basically uh, in concert with the US media and international um, Western media. Um, remember, the media was embedded with, with the Americans um, and at that time, started to describe this war through terms of, of women's oppression. And um, that's why I had those little photos of all of the women with a purple finger stained right next to the image that I made, right? So those are, two, I was just showing some examples of the kind of propaganda imagery um, that was aimed to sort of pull at the heartstrings of, of, uh, of women's rights and women activists and feminists worldwide, everybody, right? Basically saying, oh, look at this, women are going to have the first democratic vote uh, and that's the purple stained fingers. Um, and, but, the, the, but the truth is that Iraqi women always voted. I mean, it, under the Ba'athist regime, Saddam Hussein, there was really only Saddam to vote for, but, but they always voted and their, and their rights and protections were enshrined in constitutional Iraqi laws um, and the, per, per, uh, the personal clause, uh, article clause that, that governed their social sphere as well. Um, just as a, a quick context, um, you know, sexual political violence against women um, such as rape, uh, sexual assault is 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 not unique to Iraq under war. Those are the conditions of war where um, the the veneer or or the the sort of stopgap of the accept, accept, acceptability of rape culture um, gets removed, right? And so uh, that's definitely a certain part of it. But really, that the that the power and the regime that the United States helped usher into power that those who they helped um, bring into power because they were losing that war. Um, were actually uh, attacking women's um, uh, historic rights and, and protections. Um, and uh, so the, these are multiple things happening, war, violence. These are spaces that make women's lives, everybody's lives insecure, but women are especially vulnerable in these situations. And, um, and then you have an assault on the constitutions, and then you have this conflation of democracy and that we're actually improving women's lives, where the whole erosion of women's uh, social public experience working, um, uh, uh, having a, a judicial uh, process um, through the, the courts or through the criminal system, all of that was eradicated after uh, this war. And so I wanted to bring the, that language of violence, but I was also in a, this is a sort of a backstory, maybe a little less important, but I was really kind of um, taken by this, this, uh, this article I read about the rise of tattooing in Iraq in this uh, very insane um, period of mass uh, uh, bombings in the marketplace, you know, inability for the, uh, for identifications of the bodies because there were so many of them and they were so widespread. And so, and then this was the same time there were so many kidnappings, right? And these kidnaps, kidnappings were aimed at extorting money um, from, from various uh, groups and families who would pay massive ransoms to free their family members, which often work, but if those family members were indeed dead, uh, because it was a killing, these were the kinds of extortions that were happening, which we call, I call the vultures. Like they're not actually killing the individuals, they're just uh, taking advantage of a situation where chaos prevails. And so the tattooing became a, a way of uh, Iraqis to resist through the body, through an individual struggle, to actually have an identity marker on them that the, that the kidnapper would have to uh, basically speak to. Um, uh, the family and say what it was and where it was and be able to converse. And so that became a strategy of resistance, which I found really powerful um, and also became a, a means for, for identifying dead as well. Um, and and it, 
you know, there is a, a long history of, of, of identity, identity markers um, through the, uh, tattooing in Iraq traditionally uh, before uh, Saddam at some point started outlawing, outlawing the tattooing um, uh, to appease the religious, um, his religious base. So um, yeah, that's the, the sort of origins of, of that project. That's hugely fascinating, Sama, and I already have loads of more questions for you that hopefully I can bring some of them in the Q&A later. Um, but I'd, I'd like now to, to move up to, over to you, Akram, and um, given your incredible and courageous work, um, I'd like you to unpack more on, on something that you've mentioned um, earlier quite briefly, which is how the climate crisis is affecting Palestine as a place that is experiencing the consequences of, of, of colonization and, and apartheid. Um, and also, uh, is that narrative being also being silenced in the UK? Yeah, thanks, Nasreen. Um, <clears throat> well, I think, yeah, the, the situation here is really that, um, I'm in Palestine at the moment, <clears throat> is that really in the process of colonization, the Israeli state has tried to utilize any means that it's at its disposal to expel Palestinians from their land. And that's the basic dynamic. Removal as many Palestinians uh, and, the, uh, and the acquisition of much of as much of their land as is possible. And that's really been the dynamic from even before 1948, which is the Palestinian Nakba catastrophe when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled from our homes. Um, and the environment is uh, a key part of that, principally because 70% of Palestinians in 1948 were farmers. So the relationship with the land was a very intimate one, a very necessary one. Um, and the seasons, when things grew, when things were planted, when things were harvested and so forth, were and remain um, key markers in the year, which, um, uh, which determine how people live their life. So we had a really largely rural po peasant population living in Palestine who overnight their lives were completely transformed and they were made into refugees, living in refugee camps, uh, couldn't see the sky. And the accounts of the refugee camps in the 1950s are dire. They had the second highest mortality rate in the world. Um, and it was a really, let's be honest and say, quite a miserable existence that was um, imposed upon them. Um, and of course, the process of expelling Palestinians from their land is very similar to um, what others, other native people, you know, some is coming from the United States, uh, what other native people will have experienced, which is the, uh, the hyper exploitation then of those natural resources. Um, and uh, the mismanagement then of the, of the environment you know, and Merji was saying before, we're custodians of this land and really many indigenous accounts, people see that as being the case. Um, but there's also in the, in the process of looking at the environment as a means of extraction profit, um, you end up in quite ridiculous situations. So for example, in Palestine, there was a, a, a swampland that the Zionists completely drained in the 1950s destroying the local landscape and they had to reflood it in the 1990s because of the damage that was caused to Lake Hola, which was uh, drained and then reflooded. Or they, the kinds of trees that are planted by um, uh, a Zionist organization called the Jewish National Fund. Uh, are part of the reason the fire and resistance of the trees in certain forests is less than it might otherwise be because they're not indigenous. indigenous. So really I think that you end up in a situation where the environment is particularly vulnerable because people know how to sustain and care for it and um, have been expelled from that land. And you know, another is about the kinds of olive trees that are planted here. Palestinian olive trees, you don't water them because they're unnecessary to. It's how you terrace the land that makes it sustainable. Israeli, Israeli olive trees, many of the ones in settlements, you are, are required to be watered and um, they produce fruit twice a year. Yeah, and, and you talked earlier about the uprooting of, of olive trees and native trees, which is a deliberate act of, of um, destruction. It's a, it's a form of ecocide in itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, certainly. And, you know, that's in the service of also of taking the land and, of, and building walls between the farmers and their land so they can no longer ex access it. So, you know, this is why I think that, um, you know, when people talk, for instance, about intersectionality, or 
ways of forming unity of different struggles. It's not that there's a green struggle and then there's an anti-colonial struggle and we need to somehow make them overlap. It's inevitable that if you return people um, or you retain, keep uh, uh, land in the hands of people who know how to care for it and look after it and may extract profit in some capacity, but direct that land for the use of um, sustaining and promoting human uh, and life and, and the environment itself, then you, then you are participating in the green movement or environmental politics or however you might wish to distinguish it. So I think that's really the essence of what, um, what I think about the, the, the overlap of the environment and the struggle for, for justice in Palestine. And in terms of, of um, how this narrative is being addressed in political spaces in the UK, um, do you think there's also still um, silencing around issues of, of crisis, climate crisis, and how it's affecting Palestine in extension to um, the other problems around, around democracy and censorship and, and lack of transparency that you've addressed earlier? I think, um, I, mean, I don't want to go too much off topic, but you know, I read this, one of those little things that pop on on Instagram that talk about, you know, what is gaslighting? And then I read it and it's just struck me that, I'm generally opposed to this kind of characterization of things, but it just struck me that it really described well the British state and the British establishment's relationship to colonial history. First of all, I think it was saying it didn't happen. And if it did happen, then um, uh, it didn't matter. And if it did matter, then we didn't mean it. And if we did mean it, uh, then it wasn't that bad. And if it was that bad, it was just like, so it just really struck me of, you know, that's really my experience when I hear people talking about Palestine in the UK, which is that it never happened. And then if it did, it's not that big deal. Um, and so I think that the moment you really have this sense in the UK and what the prevent legislation, other things have tried to really focus on and in the US, they have CVE countering violent extremism is to take Palestine out of a comp out of this framing of a comprehensible, very normal, very uh, admirable struggle for justice and freedom and to put it into the camp of extremism or potentially extreme views. And um, the idea isn't to outright criminalize, but just say, if you're talking about Palestine, you're talking about something that's a bit dodgy and mm -hmm. we need to monitor it, or you need to think twice about it or you need to be very careful how you talk about it and you better not slip up in any way because otherwise you're, you're a murderous terrorist or you're an extremist of some yeah. kind. So it's a systematic act of erasure and complicity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Akram. And um, we only have about five minutes left and I wonder if there are any questions from the audience to our wonderful speakers. Any burning questions that could be shared in the chat box or the Q&A box? You can see. Um, Jennifer Tibbles asks, what gives you hope? So anyone can unmute them. Yes, go ahead, Summer. So um, the, the, the civil protests of the la from, that started in 2018-19 in Iraq, um, in, in the south, in Basra, and in Baghdad, although was met with uh, abhorrent uh, violence on the part of the Iraqi government and the Iran-backed militias, um, this is a youth uh, protest movement for social justice. It is... Um, uh, it cuts across class, uh, religions, ethnicities and gender. And it maintained, obviously the COVID situation made it much more complicated because uh, it, it, it thwarted a lot of the work, but it is ongoing and it has uh, um, uh, put on notice <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the government of the catastrophes of, of, of human rights, but especially the environment um, and the, 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 the horrible situation going on in the South with water 
Um, Four million people in Basra with water rights, just, just the water is completely polluted. It's oil spills in the Shaq al Arab, the energy crisis, the ways that Iraq's natural resources are being exploited for profit and the corruption on the backs of people, right? Of ordinary people. And that, that the social protest comes from Iraqis, homegrown, organized, together, engaged in conversation through multiple um, um, uh, manners from, from physical disobedience to cooperation to reading chains. It also makes me think of the Great March of Return in Palestine, the, 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 the social awakening um, that is grassroots of that region and, and the willingness to go up, up against tyranny. That gives me some hope. Just wanted to um, echo everything that uh, Sama said. I guess what also kind of just gives me hope is kind of just realizing and understanding that the problems that we face didn't just come down from the heavens. They're like made by uh, the man-made decisions, mainly, you can argue, mainly by men in suits. So as a result, good human decisions can really change everything for the better. And I, I really do believe that the recent global events have massively transformed what is possible, whether that be, of course, the global pandemic, the climate crisis and the fight against and racism and they've all kind of really exposed not only the deep inequality within our society but what many people have been arguing for a long time that we are only as secure as the most vulnerable amongst us so that means a child in Rotherham has got as much value as a child in Palestine and just kind of understanding that we're all in this together and I think especially now like it kind of feels like the realms of what can be done have been dramatically, she would say, expanded over a lot of kind of recent events. And I think as a result, you're seeing, we're starting to see a lot of people who are seriously considering what's possible and as a result are really demanding a lot more. So that's one of the many things that kind of gives me a lot of hope. And if I've got two minutes to sneak in. Um, I would say that uh, the past period in Palestine is an extraordinary reason for hope because in the space of uh, a few weeks, uh, the political environment and the landscape changed incredibly from protests starting in Jerusalem all around the country to the Palestinian refugee camps in exile. And one of the most incredible things that happened was that a general strike was called, I think it was uh, um, May 18th, it was called the day before, and the next day there was a general strike in every Palestinian community and pictures being shared everywhere um, of all the shot shuttered uh, uh, mass non-compliance, teachers, hospital workers, um, builders, everyone refused to go to work. And it just shows that um, in a very short space of time, what we take for granted, i.e. the system has created this dire environmental disaster that we're trying to currently live through, in a very quick space of time, things can turn around. And so even though things are very dark at the moment, I never, I never despair. And I think that humanity will be able to save itself. It might be at the last minute, but that it will happen. And the, the hope lies in the extraordinary will of people around the world, particularly in Palestine, in my view, for justice and freedom. Jennifer sends her thanks for sharing your depth of knowledge and for your leadership. And she sends her blessings. And what a wonderful way to close the event is to talk about hope. Um, and I think it is a responsibility to be hopeful. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased and, and quite inspired to hear about how you identify where these spaces of hope can be located. Um, and it's, it's very important to try and, 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 and trace these spaces and try and identify them and celebrate them and highlight them whenever they exist, no matter how small they are. They are really important in the bigger narrative. So thank you very much for the wonderful speakers um, and for your inspirations, for your insights and for your generosity. Um, you've left us with so much to think about today. And thank you for the audience, for your presence and for your participation. Thank you for Liverpool Arab Arts Festival and Creative Destruction for your wonderful curation and organization. Um, and um, hopefully we might meet again in another event in the series. Thank you all.